welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. Welcome to another episode of the Barnyard Language Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here again today on the pod. Katie, what is going on in Iowa these days? Not a whole lot. We got our first frost last night, I think. Jim says there was frost the night before. You beat us to frost. We haven't had any yet here in Ontario. I mean, we got just enough to get like the top of the car. So not anything worth writing home about. Guys started fourth crop hay this week. And other than that, not a whole heck of a lot. It's really been, oh, the girl child started clover kids yesterday, which is the kindergarten through third grade version of 4-H. They apparently built a volcano. Oh, that's a good start. She's five and she's very enthusiastic. So she talks very, very fast and not terribly clearly, but I think that's what she meant. And you're tired. (laughs) That's a big yawn. Yeah. Otherwise, nothing. Oh, well, this is an eventful update then. I thought I had more, but I don't think I do. I think that was it. What's happening in your world, Arlene? Well, after last week at the plowing match, then I also went to a fair for the day because it's fall fair season here. So we had, my husband was judging the dairy 4-H show in the morning and then he and my daughter and myself as assistant we showed some heifers then in the open show at the same fair in the afternoon so after three days at the plowing match and then a day at the fair I was all peopled out because I'm not used to seeing anyone other than cows and the people who live in my house most days so that was a very big week for me so I've been kind of just recovering all week and hiding out in my house and we recorded some interviews this week so that's kind of fun and i also had the first visit to the hospital in a while not for me so the our second oldest was moving something with my husband and it was a shelf and he let go and it the top of the shelf hit him in the head as he dropped the bottom of the shelf anyway it was sideways so he got a bit of a gash to, to the head. So we did a, a tag team hospital visit. My husband went and waited for a few hours in the ER and then I waited for a few hours and they ended up just gluing it back together. So it's right along the hairline. I'm sure he won't have a scar, but he said if he did, he thought he'd look like Harry Potter. So <laughs> it's not it's not super visible, but it's a long wait. But yeah, and those head wounds always bleed like a son of a gun. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it, it really in the end was, was not yeah in the end it wasn't all that much in terms of of fixing it up but i think the the glue was probably a good idea yeah and oh the other news is a pup date so the our dog is just over a year old and he's a jack russell and we started him in a ratting course we were looking into doing agility or something to keep him keep his little mind busy and we found a local agility place that also does ratting. So he's been learning how to look for and identify rats. Not as good at it as I thought, you know, like I'm thinking we're going in, he's a Jack Russell Terrier, like this is what he's bred for. He's gonna go in and be the best one in the class. I would say that he's not, but he's doing very well and he's figuring it out. So so they actually have, if you've prob- probably most people have not done ratting, um, they have live rats in like PVC pipes with a bunch of holes in them. And so then they hide them in little mazes and bales of straw and stuff. And you have to go around with your dog and in the early stages of the class, just identify the one that actually has the rat in it. Cause then there are decoy ones that have, don't have anything in them. So that is one of our weekly activities now is taking the dog to class. We actually have a pup date along the same lines. I assume it was a pup date. Yesterday, somebody left me a stuffed mouse with catnip in it and also a dead field rat. And I'm pretty sure that it was the puppy. 
No, it, no. it wasn't a, an Amazon delivery to you. To no, it was know. not. Definitely not DoorDash, Rat, yeah. Yeah. Rodent, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. This um, is for you. No, but, you know, cats normally only leave organs or they just eat the whole damn thing. And none of our house cats is ambitious enough to kill something at all. So before we really get started, we usually tell people that swearing is okay on our podcast. Not that you have to, but if you do, if that's part of your vocabulary, it's fine. We don't edit it out. Arlene, I'm going to like insist on a swearing quota that if <laughs> you and our guests we... don't meet it, it will just be a nonstop stream of obscenities uh, out of me. Yeah. Then you just have to curse a lot at the end. Yeah. Um, and if kids, animals, whatever interrupt, totally fine. And we... Well, I've locked them in the living room with the door shut. So they should... <laughs> Uh, you may see uh, a dog walk in. He has separation anxiety, oh. and I've locked him in the other room, and hopefully he'll behave. If not, then my husband's going to open the door and let him come in here with me. So today we're talking to Krista Huss, who is a first-generation farmer joining us from North Carolina. So Krista, we start each of our interviews with the same question, and this is a way to introduce yourself to our listeners, and we ask, what are you growing? So this can cover crops and livestock, kids, animals, businesses, all kinds of stuff. So what are you growing? Well, as of right now, we are growing cotton, soybeans, goats, chickens, kids. I'm growing a goat lotion slash goat milk soap business. And at the moment, I have a quite large growing laundry pile. So it is harvest time. <laughs> Perfect. Told so you she clarify. was one of us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so clarify a few things. How many kids and what ages are we talking? I have two boys. They are eight and six. And the other kids, the goats, how many of them? I mean, that doesn't have to be as precise. I know you um, have others you have, but goats is, you know, maybe fluctuates. Oh, I want to know how many animals I have at any moment. Okay. I can, yeah. So I have 26 goats and two donkeys. Oh, cute. And how many chickens do you have? At the moment, I'm at 18. And how many did you start with? Well, I started with four and then in less than a year went up to 60. And I'm back down to 18 now. But that'll be growing soon. I'm fixing to add more on. So We like to talk about the chicken math because I feel like yeah, it's, it's, it's real. Well, it's it's like real. It's spoken secret that everybody's like, I must be the only one who's done this. And I'm like, no. Nope. No. Nope. All right. And how many acres are you guys farming? Total, we are at a little over 300, I think. It's where we are. Yeah, so that's about the same size we have. I just like to hear, you know, because there's such a huge variety of acreage yeah. that people are running, you know, from yeah. urban vegetable growers to ranchers. Right. They're real, real spread. So how did you get started in agriculture? My family has no farming experience. I married a fourth generation farmer. I married into farming. And at first... I hated it. I actually have like a, a few topics that I speak on. And one of them is from rivalry to farm family. I hated farming when we first got together. It took time away from me that he didn't need to spend with me. And I finally realized I'm just going to have to adapt. And over time, I just slowly, as I was around it more, I became more involved. I was asked to run parts, to run and get fuel. And now I'm at a point to where I pretty much run the livestock side of our operation. I do help out on the row crop side. You know, I can run numerous equipment, tractors. I run a module builder packing cotton in the fall. So I've went from hating farming to pretty much being in charge of one side of our operation. So when you talk about farming as your rival, what do you feel like brought you from that place to to where you are now was it just time or do you feel like there was there were more things that kind of moved you between the so, two places yeah I feel like time yes it took time for me to understand the passion in it the passion that my, my husband and my father-in-law farmed together I saw the passion that they had and how hard they worked and I just, you know, I realized, well, if I want to be with him, he's not going to quit. They say it's in your blood. And I totally believe that. You know, when we first started dating, if I'd asked him to choose farming or me, he would have chose farming, no question. And I just realized over time, you know, 
I love him. He loves farming. So I'm going to have to compromise and give a little. And I think by giving a little, I just kind of slowly fell in love with it over time and just became more involved. And here we are now for a family. <laughs> I think outsiders assume that it's like a family business, like owning a store or something. And, you know, you lock the door at the end of the night. And you yeah. Home, and if you don't want to open, you don't open. And it's like, no, no we had plans, but we're cutting hay you know yeah or, or we're having a first time mama giving birth you know we want to be there with her or they're or half have, a mile down the road and now everybody's got to drop everything to go get the damn thing yeah we have a hurricane coming through but animals still got to eat and be checked on so mm -hmm. <laughs> it is you know i feel like at least for our family it's like having a whole nother member of the family but one yeah. who's real high maintenance for sure and kind of a pain in the ass and so, i mean it's like having another little kid but yeah big yeah yes and even messier than yeah. my children which is really saying something yeah yeah so we're both from more northern places and honestly about the most i know about cotton is that my four-year-old son has seen one in a brooder ad and really wants a i think it's a cotton picker or a cotton baler i wasn't paying attention yeah what can you tell us about cotton farming Oh my goodness, cotton is my favorite. So we plant cotton in early to mid-May. We have to wait until the ground temperature gets to 65 degrees or above. Cotton is real picky. So plant it around early mid-May. And then by the 4th of July, maybe a little bit after, we start looking for blooms. And by blooms, I mean it's an actual flower that starts out blooming white, changes to pink, dark pink, and then it starts to dry out, turn brown, and it'll fall off over about a five-day period. So when the flower falls off under it is what we call a square. And this is a teeny tiny little square, probably the size of a pencil eraser. And this is what grows into the cotton bowl that the cotton is inside of. So it grows and throughout the summer, we have to spray the cotton to keep it from growing. You know, it'll grow, I mean, as tall as a tree pretty much. So we grow it, we spray it, I'm sorry, with a restrictor to kind of manage the size that it gets to. Um, so we do that all summer. And then cotton on its own starts to open. And by open, I mean open up to see the white cotton. So it's, doing that now we have to come in when the cotton opens up 50 percent well 50 percent of the field is opened naturally on its own we go through with what we call a defoliant and we spray it and this causes the remaining bowls to open up and it causes the leaves to dry up and fall off so that when we harvest all that's on the plant is the bowl with the cotton inside and once we spray it, it takes about 10 to 14 days, and then we will be picking it. Had we not have this hurricane come at their nail, we would be spraying cotton already. But we're kind of waiting to protect the ones that aren't open from the weather. So we start picking. We pick with the cotton picker. Um, so when we pick the cotton, it goes into a basket on the back of the picker. And from there, we will dump it into what we call a bowl buggy, which is like a big buggy that we can transport the cotton from the middle of the field to the edge of the field to the module builder. And this is a machine that has a, a arm that goes back and forth, like forward and reverse and up and down. And it packs the cotton into a big, what we call module. This module is, you know, the size almost of a tractor trailer, like the trailer part, not quite as long, but about the same height. From there, a truck from the gin that we use, they come pick up the cotton, haul it to the gin, and they will gin it to get out the seeds and to get out, you know, the debris, pieces of limb, stick, leaves that's in there. They will get that out. They will pack it into another smaller bale, and then they kind of manage the selling part for us. So once it leaves our farm, we don't see it again. So they gin it, send it off to sale, and then we receive, you know, the check, the money from it. So that's kind of the whole process in a not three-hour description. So does cotton grow other places besides the the southern part of the U.S.? I mean, so it must, right? 
Yes. Cotton, it grows in, I think it's 17, 16 or 17 states total. So all of the South, I think as far North as it goes, there's some in Virginia and there's some in the boot hill of Missouri. And then all the remaining Southern states, it's also grown in California, Texas, and I think there's some in Arizona. Cotton likes warmer climates. It needs a longer period of warmth. So that's why it's locally to the South and warmer states so is the is the cotton bowl technically a fruit then if it's um a flower and seeds and yes okay it's considered yeah it's considered that because of the flower and the seed it's a flower plant a lot of people that confuse this on but technically it is it's so interesting to learn about crops that we don't grow it is no and i'll throw this thing about growing cotton like I know. And I went and spoke to a local elementary school last year on cotton and these kids knew nothing. I actually brought in some cotton. And so I handed each student a cotton bowl. Well, this one kid looked at it. He picked the cotton out, popped it in his mouth. He just thought because it grew in a field, that meant you ate it. That they, they had no clue. Like it was cotton candy right there. I mean, it was very eye opening for me to just see the lack of knowledge that you know this generation has yeah because especially considering they're in a place where they could see it in a field right you know right absolutely kind of understand you know that we don't know much about it because it's not something that's around us but even within your own community to know that people don't even know what's growing in their fields but i suppose that happens here too i mean like people see field corn and think it's fields and fields of sweet corn yeah yeah. So is cotton a crop that has to be rotated fairly heavily or can you pl- replant year after year or what's your... Cotton doesn't have to be on a rotation like corn and soybean does. Corn and soybeans and wheat does. We typically try to plant the cotton closer to our house just because it makes it easier moving equipment if we can keep it as local as possible. But cotton can be hard on the ground so we have to keep up a very good schedule as far as putting fertilizer and putting nutrients back in the dirt sure now i know there's some people who are doing organic cotton from the way you're describing it it sounds like there are a lot of steps in in growing it conventionally how does i know that this isn't your specialty but how does organic cotton work if there's so much of what a conventional crop requires from sprays and and other. So the cotton we grow is not organic. It is, we grow GMO cotton and GMO in a nutshell and organic, that means you put no chemicals, no pesticides on it. So I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I'm pro GMO and I will openly state that if you're against GMO, that's fine. We're all entitled to our belief. I'm not going to bust it nobody. I just want to educate. So with organic cotton, it's going to be a lot harder to grow because you're not going to be using the tools that we use to fight bugs, fight weeds. So it's going to yield less. Sure. But one of the beauties of using GMO cotton for us is that when we plant it, the GMO seed is more tolerant towards, you know, the conditions not being optimal. If it's a little bit too wet or a little too cold, you know, the seed's going to tolerate that better because it's GMO and it's not organic. Also, we have to put, we use less pesticides on our GMO cotton because it's been modified to be, you know, more resistant towards the insects that may attack it, eat it, kill it. So. We're not organic, no, but we do use less pesticides and chemicals because of GMO not being organic. Also, our cotton is not irrigated. Um, GMO cotton is more tolerant towards drier drought conditions, so we don't have to irrigate our cotton. So, I mean, we're not organic, but because we're using GMO, it helps us to be more sustainable overall. So, does each plant grow flowers like all over it or just one and if it got as tall as a tree would there be flowers all the way up or would it just be like two at the bottom and then 20 feet of 
Lots bullshit on yeah, top. Yeah, so the plant has branches, and on each branch is several bowls, which is what you know the flower turns into. So it's all over the plant, you know, from the bottom to the top. It would just the height thing is it's hard to pick it once it gets to a certain height because the machine we can't like put it on stilts and make the machine higher. Plus, if it gets too tall, it becomes too heavy with bowls, and it's going to you know flop over. So that's kind of why we restrict the height. But yeah, the thing plant will be covered. It's kind of like a dwarfing an apple tree then. Yeah. But with apples that don't taste good. So at the time that we're interviewing you, like you said, there's a hurricane coming. So what can that potentially mean for your crop? What it, does the potential to do damage or has that happened in the past in terms of like bad weather what kinds of things throughout the year can can impact the the crop so with cotton the bowls that are opened already the wind and rain we're getting is going to damage them like i said you know we would be spraying defoliant to open them up but because of the weather we're not with cotton once it starts opening we want to get it out of the field as quick as possible you know because any rain and wind damages it when it becomes wet it becomes like stringy and just like a wet rat looking it's just stringy and that affects the quality of the fibers in the cotton so when we take our cotton to the gin it is graded on quality you know how clean it is how stretchy and the strength of the fibers and any bad weather we have on the cotton is going to affect you know the cleanliness and the quality of the fibers so wind and rain is not good on cotton and the ones that are open are going to be damaged pretty good they will dry out some but i mean there's just quality we're going to lose that you just can't get back from the cotton so even in a normal non-hurricane time just like an average rain would be enough to damage once once they've opened up so you kind of want this time of year to be pretty dry is that Correct. You know, it can handle some rain, but the weather we're getting now is, you know, we've got gusts predicted up to 50 miles an hour where we're in the four inches of rain. We're, we farmers are very crazy people. We want rain when we want it, and then we don't want rain when we don't want it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So when harvest hits, Check we want the calendar. dry. <laughs> yes, we want dry, dry, dry. Harvest. Chris, harvest. I don't, I don't even know how you seem so chill because I'm feeling anxious just thinking about this because this sounds like the worst parts of growing apples, hay, and wool at the same time. Like, uh, you got flowers, it needs to be dry, it needs to never rain on, and it needs to never yeah. be windy, and then it has to be good quality and clean. And But cotton is our money cash crop. It's where, you know, we get the most. And, you know, we can't control the weather, so there's no point in getting worked up and upset about it and letting it ruin my life, which will trickle down down and upset my kids and you know there's just no point so this is something that happens in our house and I'm sorry to my husband who is hopefully listening to this episode how do you deal with the stress of your your husband or your father-in-law getting all wound about shit like the weather that you cannot control and it I feel like it, it does it trickles down and then it's like yes I can't do anything about it but now I'm stressed out because you're stressed out and you're stressed out because your dad's stressed out and yeah. Now I yelled um, at the kids and now they're stressed out. Now they're yelling at the dog. And... So he, they do get stressed out. I try to kind of be the buffer in between the him and the kids. You know, I try to let him get his, talk, get his frustrations out with me, talk to me so that by the time he makes it home, you know, to be daddy, that he's calmed down and he's not as upset. And, you know, he's really good about keeping it tucked in until the kids are in bed and he can talk to me and vent. And, you know, I just, I try to be understanding and patient and realize, hey, if he snaps off at me, you know what? I know that he adores the ground I walk on. It's just that we're in busy season. We're not having good conditions. And I guess just being understanding and just honestly, just learning to take the the bad comments and the frustration and just live with it and know that it's not going to be like this forever. So this may be harder to answer now that you, you know he's in and out of the room, but we're a parenting and ag podcast and 
one of the reasons we started the podcast is we got, want to talk to other parents who are raising kids on farms and on the land. So what is your biggest parenting challenge these days? Well, it doesn't have to be farm related or, and I mean, obviously you can respect your kids' privacy and all that kind of stuff, but what are, are you as a parent or as a farm parent? What are you, what are you challenged with these days? So the biggest struggle for me right now is with the fact that we are in the middle of harvest, busy season, fun season, but my kids are also students in school. So they want to stay out till 9, 9.30, 10 with daddy in the field. And I am mean because I make them come home and take a bath to wash the mud out of their ears and do homework and eat supper and get in bed at a decent time. They don't understand. They think I'm doing it just to be mean. They don't understand, you know, that... I'm trying to do what's best for them and let them get rest so they can go to school and learn and not be miserable all day. So that is our biggest struggle at the moment. How often do your boys try to drop out of school? My four-year-old's been trying to drop out of preschool for about three weeks already. I know. Or six weeks into school. So Yeah, my eight-year-old tells me daily that he wants me to homeschool him. He's not mentioned dropping out. He just wants me to homeschool him. So what lessons do you hope your kids are learning from growing up on the farm? <laughs> oh, goodness. I hope they are learning hardworking. You know, they see how hard my husband and father-in-law work. The work ethic of farmers just can't be beat. You just, you can't beat a farmer's work ethic. And I stand by that 100%. I hope they learn to keep going when things are hard, you know, the things that are out of our control, it stinks, but we can't control it. And you just got to keep on going. I hope they see how my husband and I work as a team to keep the farm running and how we work together and work problems, solve problems. And I, since we've started livestock, I really want my boys to learn what it's like to care for an animal and to know what it's like to have an animal that depends on you for feed, for water, for shelter, you know, and this probably sounds cruel, but my boys are learning about death. You know, when you raise livestock, you're going to have death and they are learning that at a young age, which I'm kind of happy about, you know, that they're understanding it. They're understanding how to take care of animals. They're seeing me give shots. They're learning that. And in return, it's teaching them, well, when I go get a shot, it's not that bad because it was okay for the goats or the donkey. I just hope that they learn to be the good people that my husband and father-in-law are because they're such amazing people. So what of the achievements or skills that you've learned since you started farming are you proudest of? Like what was the biggest win? <sighs> Gosh, I would say for me, I'm proud of the trust that I'm now giving, the trust that my husband and father-in-law have in me. Just yesterday, my husband needed to be in two places at one time because we have a hurricane coming. He can't do that. So he told me to go to a field that still had like two bales of hay on the ground. He told me to take the pickup truck and the tractor was there and he wanted me to load a round bale on the back of his truck, you know, with the tractor and the fork. I'd never done that before, but he trusted me and knew that I knew how to operate the machinery good enough to get the job done. So I'm proud of the trust and the responsibility that I am given and that I am able to help and make their lives easier. For me, it's been neat to see my kids pick up skills that I don't have yet. <laughs> I say yet because they're, you know, like, because there are things that, that my teenagers are doing on the farm that have not been my chores, but, you know, it all, it's also good proof to me that they're, you know, like that I can learn new stuff because if my, if my, my kids can pick up these things and run equipment and, and do some of the chores that I've never been tasked with, then clearly those are things that I could also eventually, learn. not that I necessarily want to, because I'm okay <laughs> to delegate, but yeah. But to see everybody learning together too, right? That we're all... I'm coming back to a question that I thought of at the beginning and forgot. Can you tell us a little bit more about your goat milk products? About my what? Your goat milk products? Oh, like the, goat the stuff. milk, yes. So I... That's just yours? Like that's your... your yeah. 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 So 
I kind of stumbled upon this. So one of our mama goats, she is, she ha- she's a, most of our goats are Kiko goats, but this one was half dairy. And because of that, she produced more milk than our other goats. So she only gave birth to one baby. And because she's dairy producing too much milk and she was on the verge of getting mastitis. So my husband and father-in-law said, well, we're just going to get rid of her. And I was like, whoa, 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 no, no. Because then we're going to be bottle feed the baby. I was like, yeah, no. I was like, I'll just empty her out. She'll be fine. So I started milking her and she didn't get mastitis. So I thought, well, I'll just milk her once a day and we'll be fine. And we were. So I would milk her and then I would give the milk to the dogs and the cat. And so I got to thinking, I was like, gosh, this is a lot of milk. What could I do with this? So I started researching and I stumbled upon lotion and soap. And I was like, huh, this could be another way to bring in some money from home. And I started playing around with recipes and, you know, because you have to add all these ingredients at certain percentages to get it to the um, quality of lotion or soap you want. So I started experimenting and handing samples out and people were like, oh, this is good. So I just kind of thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And I've spent months, probably six months, getting my recipe to where I want it. And I literally just posted my first batch of lotion to sell on my store site last week. Um, So with the soap, once you make it, it takes three weeks to cure. So I don't have any soap ready at the moment, but I should in the next coming weeks. I'm hoping to launch the soap early November with Christmas scents. But I really enjoy it. And it's really cool to see something coming from, you know, our livestock that I'm able to use and not waste. And it helps our family, you know, with money. So it's a win-win. Yeah. So So, you're selling online or at local markets or what's your, what's your. As of now, I have a, a Shopify storefront and I do plan on approaching some local like boutiques around here and putting some in there, but I probably will wait until maybe November, early December, just because we're in busy season. And I know that I can only handle so much at a time. So I'll probably start stocking that or looking around maybe mid-November. Second question. I've got like six questions, but I'm going to go with the top three. (laughs) Why do we make goat milk soap, but not cow milk soap? We have extra cow's milk. Is the goat milk that different? Or is it just that people who have goats are more driven to do shit like making soap (laughs) goat's milk is a lot more richer and creamier i think than cow's milk and i've also heard that goat milk the ph of goat milk is extremely close to the ph of our skin which makes it good for putting on our skin well good that's good to know third question i ran into a thing the other day about that people are making and selling goat milk soap from like powdered goat milk yeah I mean, like when i see somebody selling goat milk soap i assume that they have their own damn goats yeah how do we address and get rid of this fake goat cheating like as customers should we be demanding photos or like because if people are gonna say they deal with goats they should have to actually deal with goats oh absolutely it's like um, it's like pretending to have children right? you know I feel like. Anytime you take an original product such as goat milk and turn it into a powdered form, you're losing something. You you can't retain all the goodness of it from the powdered stuff. I personally would not, I would not buy powdered milk and make goat milk lotion and sell. I feel like that is not fair and that I'm cheating people because I don't feel like you're going to get all the benefits from the lotion and soap if you're using that. Now, if anybody out there does use it, I mean, that's, that's your business. That's you, you do you, but you know, on my label that I'm going to have on, and on the description on my website, it says that this lotion and soap is made from goats from my farm that are hand milk. So whenever you buy my product, you're going to see that it's from my farm, my goats. And on the label, it's going to say from our farm to your family. So anytime you buy a product, I think you have a right to question its origins, its ingredients. My ingredients will be listed on the label. But yeah, I just, I'm not a fan of the powdered milk. I just, I think you lose some in it. I feel like 
Two, do you think there's any other signs besides photos that people could look for to know that their soap producer actually owns goats? I mean, you could give them a good sniff test, I guess. But <laughs> like, what other signs of crazy goat people are there? And I'm saying this as, like, I feel like spiritually I'm a crazy goat person. <laughs> like, you cannot have goats and still be a crazy goat person. Like, it's a, a state of mind. I yeah. Think. So are there other, like signs you think that would would give away crazy goat people i mean i think we just talk about them we can't help but not talk about them like when i start talking to somebody like hey what do you do oh i'm a farmer let me tell you about my goats like i just i just feel like we talk about them and that we can't within the first few minutes that yeah you're gonna know within about two minutes of talking to me that i'm a mama and i raise goats and chickens we talk about it because we're proud you know i'm proud of the goats and the life that I give them. So I guess they're just going to talk about it, but I don't know. Like, I don't think you could just look at me and be like, oh, she's a crazy goat person. I feel like you'd have to talk to me for at least two minutes. Well, it would depend on how, how long you'd been off the farm that day or if you'd meant to be off right. the farm. Kid. Right. Because I don't like being off the farm. I don't like people like public. I, I don't. Fair, and fair enough. Yeah. My son had a event at school last night, a musical, and that's the most people I'd been around in a long time. And I was like, just, can we go now? Can I go home? <laughs> I've realized that with working from home in the pandemic and my husband taking the kids to school, like I leave the farm maybe once a week now. Yeah. And even that's a little much, like as long yeah. as there's snacks and books here, I don't really need to go yeah i know yeah, yeah i went I to that. i went to like a farm show type thing last week and a fair and it's taken most of most of this week to recover yeah well, i feel that so, so moving please. back to the human kids what is your favorite thing about the age and stage that your kids are at right now so i love my eight-year-old more than my six-year-old my eight-year-old <laughs> thank you for being honest I hope he's standing back there. <laughs> no, let me finish my statement. It sounded horrible. My eight-year-old is more into the farm than my six-year-old. So my eight-year-old is old enough that he can be taught things. He can be taught to run equipment. He loves to run the module builder when we're picking cotton. He drove a tractor by himself for the first time this week. So I love seeing the interaction of my husband teaching him and his little face as he's just soaking it all in. And then seeing the pride on his face as he's running that module builder or driving that tractor by himself. Just seeing the pride on him as he learns new things. And he's at an age where he can. That just melts my mama heart seeing that. Okay, now you Is there anything you do love about the six-year-old? <laughs> yes. He, he is very proud of our farm. He has a bit of... ADHD and sensory processing disorder. So he doesn't do well, like sitting in a tractor 12 hours a day, but he is very proud of our farm. You know, he likes to tell people about it. He likes to try to educate people and tell people at school. He'll come home and say, I told my teacher that we're almost ready to pick cotton. So he is very proud of the farm and he is proud of his dad and brother and that is very sweet and heartwarming heartwarming warming to me he he enjoy, he enjoys the livestock side more than he does the road crop so he's my little goat chicken buddy you know he helps me feed them and he has his favorite goats and he looks at them and makes sure they're okay and at six he can already tell you when a goat you know is not acting right he's like mommy look at charlie brown he's by himself like he's picking up on normal and not normal animal behavior. And I think that's very amazing to be six and doing that. So how many times a day do your kids explain farming to you? I mean, I assume this is not just my house where my kids are happy to tell me about the way the world works. Yeah, a lot. Not so much, not as much now that they're in school seven hours a day, but like last night, we were we were sitting on the couch and my eight-year-old said, hey, mommy, when you're driving a tractor, do you let the clutch out slow or fast? Trying to quiz me. He likes to quiz me to see if I know things. And I said, oh, you let it out real fast. And he's like, no, you don't. And I'm like, I know, I'm just aggravating you. So he likes to quiz me a lot on my farm knowledge, which cracks me up. I think just, you should just start yelling, grind it till you find it every time he asks you a question. 
oh, that's a good idea. There you go. I might do that. I don't know how my kids are ending up like this. <laughs> I've done that. Get in here. So wait, now I have to ask too, are your kids both wearing red shirts and black shorts? Or is one of them just running by real fast? Because I thought I saw two of them at the same time. They, I think they do both have on a red shirt, actually. And are both your dogs chocolate labs? Or is no, it- one's black, one's chocolate. Okay. Because I was, I was feeling a real sense of deja vu watching your family come yeah. through here. <laughs> There's just all this speaking of ADHD. We're, we're only, uh, yeah, you're <laughs> only getting the, the audio, but Krista is every once in a while pointing to the room where they're supposed to be. Yes. Lucy. Yes. And giving them a main look. She's trying. <laughs> yeah, she can, is doing her best. See, yeah, we trying can, to not we'll scream. I'm we'll 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 here. She hasn't threatened to mail either of them anywhere, which is usually my threat <laughs> of choice. True. Put yes. you in a box and ship you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't seem real worried about it. So right. we ask all of our guests, if you were going to dominate a category at the county fair and it could be <laughs> real or made up, what would you win? And, you know, I read that and I thought long and hard. And I feel like there's so many things. I don't want this to sound arrogant. There's so many things that I do and that I'm good at, but not like the best. So I would say it would be spoiling goats would be my category because my husband gives me a very hard time about how petted our goats are. There is one that I feed by hand because she's the smaller one, the runt, and gets pushed out of the feed bowl. And I hand feed her every day. She'll eat in the bowl until she's kicked out. And then she comes to me and I hand feed her. So I would say spoiling, having the most spoiled goat. And she's like a dog. She follows me around. She jumps on my back and tries to get my attention. So I would be gold medal for having a spoiled goat. So what I'm hearing you say is that your husband is a mean is a meanie face goat hater he's not that's what i heard okay <laughs> well that's I mean, what i heard in, though in my mind he is yes but he is not he does like most livestock farmers do he does the minimum he keeps them fed he keeps them watered and he doesn't love the livestock side like i do so it's not where his passion is that's my passion so i go above and beyond and he thinks my above and beyond is spoiling them I mean, him and him and his dad have failed. I mean, we've got tons of hay put up to last us through the winter. So, I mean, he does that, but he is not as big of an animal person as I am, I guess, is the reason. Have you started threatening to buy a horse yet? No. Because that's never... where I go when my husband's pissing me off. I threaten to buy a horse. No. That just I his butt. You know, I've never been a really big horse person. I've rode a horse once and had a bad experience. By bad, I mean, we were like galloping, trotting, whatever. The horse like slammed on brakes and threw his head down to start eating. And I literally flipped over his head. So I'm just not a big horse person. I do want an alpaca. I feel like threatening him with an alpaca is maybe worse than threatening him with a horse. It is because they're a lot more expensive. Well, I don't know. They're... I don't know if they're more expensive. They're more hard to find, and they're just a weird animal. And they got the weird teeth, too. Yeah, so I I threaten with an alpaca and a peacock. I want a peacock. Well, and I, I feel like you could win it being willing to say that you're good at lots of stuff, because I feel like that's... I was thinking about this the other day, that the reason we ask it like this instead of just asking what you're good at is when you ask people what they're good at, they'll say, well, I'm not really that good at anything. yeah. And they I are, feel like I, they wouldn't still be doing this. Jack of all trades, master of none, I think is about where I'm at. <laughs> master of enough to get by. That's true. Okay. And keep kids and animals alive. Yes, that's right. Well, your goats definitely deserve, definitely need to give you a trophy someday for your attention. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move us into our cussing and discussing segment. We've registered for an online platform called SpeakPipe, where you can leave your cussing and discussing entries for us, and we'll play them on the show. So go to speakpipe.com backslash barnyard language, and you can leave us a voice memo, or you can always send us an email at barnyardlanguage at gmail.com, and we will read it out for you. Katie, what do you have to cuss and discuss this week? So I was trying to think, and I'm going to say school photos, because now I've got two babies in school bringing home school photos every year. And A, when the hell did they get so expensive? I 
they didn't used to be fifty dollars a, a shot, did they? I mean, I can't imagine that my mom would have ever paid fifty bucks for a set of photos of me. She still wouldn't, I don't think. So, <laughs> uh, fair enough. But a, they want to retouch them, and they want my kids to brush their hair, and they want them to smile. And I'm like, none of this. They don't look like my kids. If you retouch them and brush their hair and yell at them to smile, they don't look like my children, you know? And then where do you hang them all? Like, I feel like I should hang them in the stairs because that's where people hang them. But then do I buy like 26 matching frames right now so that they're all in the same frames? And then I only have 11 stairs, but preschool plus 12 years of school is 13. And so now then where the hell did the last four photos go? And, uh, Arlene, this is why I have not won a Nobel Prize or anything, because my brain is too busy with shit like, how do I perfectly I, align 13 years worth of school photos on 11 steps? I will say, I don't know if this makes me a bad parent or not, but I have not bought school photos every year. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And sometimes I will just cut out the little proof for the, like, the frame where it has like from their kindergarten to grade 12 photos. I'll just take like the proof shot, stick that in there and not actually order them because sometimes they're not that great. And compared to when we were growing up, I have 5 million pictures of all of my children. And I mean, my parents took a lot of pictures. I've got like albums, but I mean, like think back to the, you know, our grandparents, their school photo, my, they never, well, they never had a school photo, but like they had like a dozen pictures of their whole childhood and ours have 5 million. So no guilt if you don't want to buy them. Well, that's a really good I point. I mean, if you already ordered them, go ahead. But Well, and this year I didn't really think about it. And so we just did family photos less than a month ago. So they still look the same as they did a month ago. Yeah. Like, same kid. And in a natural yeah. setting. They, they change like. a lot from year to year, but it was kind of pointless to, you know, get two photos done within a, like a week of each other. I think it was by the time mm -hmm. they took them. I was like, We're just like, well, I'm also... I'm also a photographer, as if I don't have enough going on. I'm a photographer, so I never buy school pictures because they get the kids in these weird poses and say, okay, say cheese, and they have these horrible looks. Whereas I can take my kids out on our field and make donkey and goat noises and get original laughs out of them. So I never buy school pictures. Mine are way much, way better. This year I told my daughter, because I'm nap mom, I said, you don't have to smile just because somebody tells you to, and especially not if a man tells you to smile. You can just stare him down. And yeah. that is the school photo we got this year. I'll post it on, <laughs> well, I guess I can't post it on social media, but it is perfection. It's her. You can tell she is just staring at that guy. Like, my mom said I don't have to smile. So, <laughs> and her hair is sticking straight up. So, looks like she's my baby. Good. Yeah, she's your kid. So, Krista, what do you have to cuss and discuss this week? Well, I have a lot, but I guess what's on my mind this week is the developing of land. In the last year, we have lost so much of our farmland to developers. And I know people have to have somewhere to live. It's just so frustrating and sad to see farmland around us going up in little bitty apartment condos. It's just frustrating. And, you know... In my area, a lot of our local farmers are aging out of farming or passing and the land is being passed down to the younger generation and they see money signs. So it's, you know, perfect for the developers to have land they're wanting to sell. Yeah, we'll buy it. So it's just frustrating to see the land being developed and how much, you know, my generation doesn't value agriculture and they just want land to be to have I want money they don't lay and they want money and it's just it's frustrating as a farmer to see land being done away with you know because we still have to feed and clothe people and we're having to do it on less land and it's just it's just hard and disheartening to see yeah, well I know sure. They're not making any more, right? They always say no, that. no. They're not making any more land. No. Yeah, we're we're feeding, feeding, like you said, feeding and clothing more people all the time. There's there are less of us in yeah. production agriculture. We're trying to make do with more, and then we still have those external pressures of people saying, "Oh, you can't do it that way. We don't yeah. want you to produce that way." <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, we have to use our resources well. The one that gets me too is around here, you know, you hear more and more older farmers saying, well, young folks aren't coming back, but then they've also bulldozed every farmstead they could find to, you know, put an yes. acre of corn on them. Like, well, where do you want them to come back to? Because there aren't any mm -hmm. houses. You know, they just bulldozed one of my favorite houses last week, put up another grain bin. Like, you guys, you can't, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. That's not how it works. Anyway, Arlene, what do you have to cuss and discuss? So before Krista came on today, Katie and I were having a chat about childcare. And this led me to my cussing for today about how we, as a society, as a people, have decided that people who play sports ball can make millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But we claim that our children are our future and they're our priority and they're the most important. And yet child care workers and teachers and people who work with our babies can barely make a living wage. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't make sense if we... If we want to claim that kids are our priority, that we can't figure out a way to pay the people who are looking after them. And, and I mean, that then leads into all the other stuff like parental leave, you know, like that we, I mean, some, I know that Canada has pretty decent parental leave policies, but, but still like that we're not allowing people to, to even heal their bodies and look after their own babies for a reasonable amount of time. And then when we expect them to send them to daycare, that we can't pay those people the wages that they deserve for looking after our children. Ridiculous. This came up because I was telling Arlene, I'm on the, the board for our local nonprofit daycare where um, my kids go and uh, we're paying as, as well as we can. <laughs> I don't think so. Just want to make sure you're not getting yourself in trouble. Everyone who works at our daycare could make better money working basically anywhere else. And they wouldn't have to put up with our kids. So, you know, we don't, we don't give them enough credit and we don't give them enough money. No. And that's luck. Even school teachers, a local county that borders our county, something happened with their payroll and they took out double taxes on them out of like two or three paychecks in a row. And they've yet to get that money back. They're having a hard time getting it refunded and want through all that. And I'm like, they already make very little. And now you're taking double taxes and not giving them their money back. Yeah. And it's, oh, oh it's just too hard. We'll figure it out later. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You can't pay your bills. Yes. It's, and they're leaving. And I wonder why teachers are leaving. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. On that note, thank you so much, Krista, for joining us today. Yeah, it was so know nice. more about you and your farm. Remind us again where we can find you online, where people can follow you. I'm on Instagram as Huss Family Farms, as well as on YouTube as Huss Family Farms. I'm trying to get my YouTube built up and get more active on that side of things. So it's a work in progress, but I am posting and sharing on there as well. Well, thank you so much. It was great to meet you and fingers crossed and all that kind of stuff that the hurricane is a gentle one. I don't know what kind of hurricane you want, but <laughs> not a bad one, right? Not a bad one. Not a bad yeah. one. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for coming to chat with us, Krista. Of course. I enjoyed it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and thank you for joining us today on Barnyard Language. If you enjoy the show, we encourage you to support us by becoming a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash barnyard language to make a small monthly donation to help cover the costs of making the show. Please rate and review the podcast and follow the show so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language. And on Twitter, we are Barnyard Pod. If you'd like to connect with other farming families, you can join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. We're always in search of future guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, get in touch. We are a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network.